Hey, welcome to Creature Features, everyone. I am Daniel Schweiger. I'm the soundtrack editor of filmmusicmag.com, and uh, this is our Anatomy of a Score series. And I'm very happy today to announce. Uh, well, I think it's always going to be Outlander for me, uh, but <laughs> <laughs> but okay. but some of your some scores: The Odd Life of Timothy Green, sure. an Emmy nomination for Into the West, uh, The Pacific, mm -hmm. uh, Hitman and uh, Pirates of the Caribbean, Dead Man Tell No Tales, Mr. Jeff Sinelli. Hello. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thanks so much for being here. Sure. Um, well, I mean, this is, this is certainly the biggest, uh, a long time coming to uh, man, man the ship of the, of right, the series sure. that you've been part of uh, since the very beginning. Um, tell us how you came to work. Uh, with Hans Zimmer's team, and, and uh, sure. we've got a clip lined up from the first Pirates, but you're familiar sure. with the Pirates? Well, you know, I was, I was Hans's intern in 1994, actually. That's when it started. So he was doing The Lion King, and that was like, I was 19, I guess. Uh, the first job I ever had in the industry, or a job, I wasn't getting paid. And jobs are the things you get paid for. It was, uh, it was volunteer work. Um, but, you know, I was in a studio. It was the first time I'd ever been in a studio, actually. Um, and then just so that was 94, Pirates was nine years later. I just, I never went home. You know, I worked for some composers there, John Powell. And then somewhere around, I guess, 1999, I think, when he was, Hans was doing Hannibal, he had heard that I had been doing a lot of good arranging work for John and he offered me a room. And I said yes, and then I became his arranger. This is the very short version of the story. But, <laughs> but, but I was his arranger on Hannibal, uh, or one of them. And then when Pirates came around, I mean, a lot of people probably know the story, but the first Pirates movie was a very short schedule because they, they were dubbing the movie uh, when they decided to change composers. So they called Hans, said, can you score the movie? And he said, yes, but I can't take credit because <laughs> he was under contract to another film. So he wrote all, all the themes overnight and called me in on a Saturday. And I remember about eight of us in a room watching the rough cut of Curse of the Black Pearl. And nobody, we didn't quite know what to make of it. We knew we liked it, but we're like, this, are they gonna watch it, you know? We had no idea. And it was literally 24 days, I think, after that we were done, right, finished recording the score. So it was like that, we watched the movie and started working right away. And we had, you know, Hans had written maybe a six minute demo, which is basically all the themes. Like he's a pirate is on there, and the Black Pearl theme, and, uh, and, uh, yeah, we just, we just went straight to it, you know. And anyway, on that first one, I think by the time we were done, some, somewhere around 27 or 28 minutes of the score came out of my room. So I kind of, uh, uh, maybe because it was such chaos, I don't know, I ended up coming out of that uh, with, uh, you know, a substantial involvement, let's say. You know, I was the star. Right. <laughs> on the on the team, and um, you know, and uh, obviously the the way the credits shook out was a little, looked a little different from that. But that's the you know that's what happened in the locker room, and then when uh, when we went around into Pirates two and three, of course, Hans said, "Why don't you come back in?" And that that's when I started really doing more actual writing. So in the second movie, the Cannibal Island music was all mine, uh, not the waltz, uh, but the the. Uh, you know, when you go into Cannibal Island. And then I also wrote the Pia Dolma theme, not at all knowing what that was going to mean for Pirates 3, because then she's, you, know, you guys know the story, but she's Calypso in that movie, and this, the theme takes on a bigger role. So, just sort of naturally, my music kind of expanded inside the Pirates world, I guess. So, so going back to Black Pearl, sure. I mean, as a, as a California kid, what did the Pirates <laughs> of the Caribbean ride mean to you? Well, okay, so I grew up very close to Anaheim uh, in Westminster, right? Uh, closer to Anaheim than Hollywood, so I would go to Disneyland and I'd ride the ride and I'd go like, I mean, it, it kind of blows you away, it even still does. The, every room has like a, a story and a punchline and a, you know, there's all these little jokes in every room and, and it's like evocative, it's exciting to be there. You know, you feel like you're going through a story. And I'll be honest with you, I had no idea they were going to be able to pull it off as a movie. I thought what everybody else thought, really? You know? And then, uh, then I saw the teaser, 
with that skeleton foot comes down and it's part of the underwater march and then I went I can't wait to see that movie and then I got a call two weeks later and it was like guess what you're also working on it you know so so it was a, you know that was um, I, I think the f earlier movies did a lot more sort of nodding to the ride you know what I mean like there's the dog jokes and stuff like that that I think were really cool but then then the uh, then they started to take on an identity of their own I think. You know, and what's interesting, you know, is that Pirates is very much a rock and roll film. And, you know, yes. when, when we were conditioned for pirate music to sound like Max Steiner, <laughs> right? Or, or, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Korngold, yeah, my apologies. Yeah, right. uh, you know, this, but this is kind of like the punk version of, Korn, <laughs> of, of Korngold, essentially going I'm into sure. the first film. Yeah, and yeah, look, there was, there was even sort of an edict right at the beginning, which was like, we're not doing those, like, woodwind runs, you know what I mean? That you kind of associate with swashbuckling stuff. It's, it's very ornamental in the traditional music. But instead, you know, taking a cue from, really it kind of came from Gore's direction, but even Johnny Depp is going, okay, I'm, I'm looking at Keith Richards as the inspiration for Jack Sparrow. So, and Gore would say things like, think of it as Cinderella at a Metallica concert. Like these were the notes he'd give to the music team. That's for the Moonlight Serenade when they're throwing our Kira Knightley up. and. Um, so we were always going, okay, the, you know, pirates are the original rock stars, right? So let, we should treat the orchestra like a rock band. And I think that's what made the music you know, have, have its own identity. It's irreverent. Now you've essentially selected for us your greatest pirates hit. So let's, let's uh, begin with the clip from Curse of the sure. Black Pearl. <laughs> I mean, you know, you, you, right from the first one, it starts off with such memorable, distinctive themes. Yeah, that, that actually was the very first thing I ever wrote for any pirates ever. That opening when Barbosa throws the apple, you know, and we always called it, we called the sequence broadside. Eventually the ships end up, you know. Um, and in fact, that's how I ended up getting my nickname. On the albums, we all have pirate nicknames. So that's, I became Jeff Broadside forever <laughs> from that cue. But it was, um, it's actually an arrangement of the he's a pirate theme. It sort of, it was disguised enough that Hans actually kind of went, where'd that come from? And I, and, you know, it's your thing. <laughs> you know? and, uh, and he got all excited about it. And that was a pretty big early hit, actually. It was, must have been played in the first meeting sort of two days after we started the job, I guess. And, um, and I think it was received really well. It was, you know, so that became um, one of the kind of iconic versions of that theme, I think. You know, it, play, play, it plays in Pirates 5, too, because I couldn't resist. <laughs> you know, and, that, and that's the thing about, you know, Hans uses, you know, a team of people, but yet this, it all comes out in a very cohesive manner. I mean, what's the trick as a composer to writing in someone else's voice and again getting that co cohesion going on? Well, I think the cohesion is not is the responsibility of the composer to wrangle that. You know, when, what my role is on this as additional music composer is really to just write what I think the scene is, or you know what I mean, like just respond to it, uh, honestly. And I think probably what makes it cohesive is like, like that piece um, was sort of undeniably right for the sequence, and it started to kind of inform other sequences in the movie, whether I wrote them or not. And so the cohesion comes as a result of, obviously Hans having written the demo that we could all, all uh, understand and use, um, but then as the score starts taking shape, cues like this, or there was one that Blake did, which was um, uh, for part of the Barbosa's curse, and, the, and it starts to end up in more than one scene in the movie or something like it, and then the cohesion just comes out of that, but by its um, kind of development. Does that make sense? Or? Uh, did it make? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> now the the second and the third films, you know, again, I think Gore Verbinski uh, is, is, if nothing else, not ambitious in, yes, in terms is. of his scope. <laughs> and again, you've almost kind of got this Lord of the Rings, this Lord of the Rings esque epic that happens with sure. the second and the third films. What was the, the challenge, knowing again that you're going to go on for? To, like do essentially two films together. Right, well actually, I wasn't aware of what the plot of Pirates 3 would be when we did Pirates 2. 
And if I was, you know, it would have been more intimidating, I think, to write the Tia Dolma theme, because I didn't realize what it was going to have to go and do. Um, but that was by design, because Gore was going, you know, this is a standalone movie, even though in, he knew what he was setting up. Um, so I think uh, we certainly knew on the second one that we had a bigger scope, and we knew we were going to make a third one. Um, but I don't, I'm not sure that there was really a... Um, Hans probably knew more about the, the score for Pirates 3, or what it would have to be. So when he started writing some of the um, longer themes, like Jack Sparrow gets a much more developed theme in Pirates 2, uh, I think he knew full well what he was going to have to do with it in Pirates 3. But for me, my work on that one was more um, self-contained. Like it was the Cannibal Island is just in a bubble, right? It doesn't recur. And, um, and I didn't know that Tia Dalma would really recur either. So. Well, we have a two-part clips, one from Cannibal Island oh and boy. one from Yadam. <laughs> I, I love that. <laughs> it's, it's such a Gore Verbinski thing to have like a woman turn into a million crabs and dump into the sea. And, you know, and, and I had asked if I could call the album, the cut on the album that had that music, Attack of the 50-Foot Woman, but that was shot down. So I just thought, it, I mean, come on. It's supposed to attack the crabs. Yeah, exactly, right? <laughs> I think it's called Calypso. <laughs> now, you know, what's interesting is that, you know, is, is rock, you can tell from the first clip, is rock and roll as these scores yeah. are, and kind of like, you know, in your, in your face, uh, sure. Eric Wolfgang Korngold, is that they, actually, they also seem authentic in, a, in the use of period instruments. Is that at the sure, same time, bit. it's an anachronistic pirate score, but it seems that yeah, maybe people would have been listening to this kind of music back in the day. Maybe, or at least the instrumentation. And, like, and I've thought about that too with Pirates 5, and I thought, boy, we've underutilized the banjo. Because believe it or not, it, you know what I mean? It actually is an instrument that made its way through the Caribbean. So Mm -hmm. There's a little bit more of it, but um, sometimes you run into issues of scale where you know you still need the huge orchestra and the choir to you know to do it. But there are um, yeah, but I think it's deliberate though. There's there's harpsichord in the earlier ones, mm -hmm. and we use it sometimes for the kind of uh, very civilized people, I guess you'd say. <laughs> the ones who are the bad guys, inevitably, right? So the pirates get uh, well. Actually, no. I guess Barbosa has a harpsichord on his ship in Pirates Five. But yeah, th yeah there, is a, there was at least some attempt at bringing in some of the period instruments to fight the synthesizers. Yeah. And as you can tell by this, this wonderful epic music we had in the uh, Calypso sequence is that this is much more of a fantasy. It goes from right. horror to fantasy with the third film, the second and third film. Yeah, I think so too. I think, um, well, the first one has the, the sort of overtly horror elements with the, you know, the, the, the skeletons and stuff. But these ones, that it's... That to me feels more like a Harryhausen moment. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Which, and I think that's a good thing. I think that's that's yeah. those are the movies I grew up on. You know, it probably is why I was able to relate to these movies and you know succeed within that context. I guess. It's a big big fan of the Sinbad movies. Yeah, I mean, I just I just Clash of the Titans was the one when I was a kid. Or I mean, I grew up. You know, Beastmaster was a huge movie, and then the more mainstream movies like Indiana Jones, Adventure was what I did. You know, because I lived in the suburbs, so I didn't get to live it. I, you know, I had to watch it on TV. I also grew up right at the time when cable TV was starting to happen, so you would get like the you know the movies that I was too young to have seen in the theater. They'd be on on Saturday afternoon. And then I'd go to the theater to see Indiana Jones, which would have been current. So, so this, the, I, I got a good education. Though. Just jumping is like essentially a dream, and you could really hear the enthusiasm. Like yeah. this is your dream come true. In a way. Uh, totally. Yeah. Pirates is is like that's yes, totally. So now we get to On Stranger Tides, the uh, fourth film. And again, we have a bit of a Spanish inflection. Uh, yeah, the, Spa the Spaniards show up. <laughs> and and. and does it, are you doing the opening? Yeah, we'll have, it, uh, okay, actually cool. have a, a clip that shows these are not the nice mermaids from Peter Pan. Oh, you so, the mermaids, right. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, so go for it. it. Check it out. <laughs> I 
I just love that dun 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 yeah, yeah. jaws. You know? <laughs> yeah, totally. And and the, that whole sequence goes on. I think it's probably two or three times longer than that. Yeah. And the it, earlier cuts longer still. Um, so there's a lot of like frantic mermaid music floating around out there. And again, you know, the fourth film occupies kind of an interesting you know space sure. between the between the previous films. Again, where you've got Blackbeard and and again yeah. the fantasy element. Yeah, and I think the, the attempt was to do a standalone piece instead of because two and three were so bound to each other. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and also to make it more Jack centric, kind of. You know, Jack has, in, in some ways, the bigger role in four as opposed to being the kind of comic relief that the other characters bounced off of. Um, and, uh, but, you, you know, I, I thought with. Blackbeard, there was a good opportunity for music, but that Hans wrote that all that theme. But I wrote the music for the Spanish army, and I wrote that mermaid sequence, and um, you know that felt like new ground to me. And, and I also th remember we brought in Rodrigo and Gabriela mm -hmm. to uh, play on the score, which was a, another kind of a, the the rock and roll version of adding the Spanish guitar in a way, actually. So. Now for Dead Men Tell No Tales, yes. you, you you get the you get the uh, the, the captain's wheel. Yes. <laughs> but at what point was did it become apparent that you were going to be the heir apparent to take over the series? Um, probably right after Lone Ranger, uh, which so and I knew I was scoring Dead Men uh, probably a year and a half before they shot it. So it was you know it was decided quite a while ago. Um, and I think it was just a matter of you know at, at some point in the last two or three movies. Um, I mean, my enthusiasm for it's obvious, right? So, you know what I mean? It's so Jerry and Disney, uh, who um, watched me then go through Lone Ranger, and there's a, you know, that's a whole other story we don't have to tell right now, but I did a lot of work on that. And so it became like, you know, this is his thing now. Let's, let's give it to him. You know? It was very organic, though. I mean, it was almost, there was, I hate to put it this way, but it was just sort of, seemed like obvious that I would be doing it at some point, you know. I, I don't even remember anyone calling me and saying you're doing it. It was just like, hey, the directors are coming over, let's sit down. You know, you know what I mean? Well, there wasn't like a party or something. <laughs> it was just like, hey, you know, it just, it, it was almost a no-brainer, I, I kind of. Now, I mean, you could say, and I have to admit that the new film was probably my favorite of the Thank series. You. and probably my favorite score of the series. Oh, what, and again, you have such an amazing wealth of themes from the, all the, the past mm -hmm. films to That's draw right. from. I mean, do you almost like checkerboard it? Like, okay, we're gonna use this theme from <laughs> this here and this theme and this, and then here's gonna be my stuff. Like, yes, you... actually, yeah, but not, not so much, there's no spreadsheet, because I don't think that way. Um, but, uh, but that is absolutely what we're thinking about. And if, okay, so before I started writing, before they shot the film, actually, so the directors, Joachim and Espen, and Hans and I all sat down. And it was really like, this is the passing of the torch meeting, right? And, uh, and it was really a matter of, you know, obviously the directors have to like me, you know? So they're, they're coming over to make sure that they're totally okay with this whole arrangement. And in that meeting, which was really probably 20 minutes long, you know, the takeaway was, Hans said, guys, these are your themes now, do whatever you want, right? Because he trusts me, he knows I'm not gonna, you know. He knows how I can I can handle that, and the other thing that we talked about was you know there's a lot of new ground. So there's Salazar, big bad guy. There's Karina, who has this huge story arc. If you guys have seen the film, she's she kind of is the story, I think. Um, Barbosa has a new role. It's related to that, and then uh, there's like an overarching like mythology of the sea music that needed to be written because that's like Henry Turner and the myths of the sea. Poseidon's trident is all the new stuff. So then it was a matter of going, well, where are we going to use the old themes? Where are we going to use the new ones? And um, that just evolved. It took the four or five months I was writing the score to, to really lock that in. Um, some of it's obvious. When you first see Jack, you kind of want to hear Jack's music. That's easy. But in other spots, you know, it was a matter of going, where are we tapping into something that's sort of like the legacy of pirates? And when are we tapping into something that's new with a new ground? You know, does that make sense? Yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, I think Salazar is coming. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> there it goes. Um, you know, in a way, the, remo the movie reminded me a lot, in a really good way, of Guardians of the Galaxy 2, in that oh. it also deals with family and sacrifice. Okay. 
And the film, actually, I got something out of this that I never expected to get, which was emotionally caught up, which I'd never right. been before Good. in the series. And right from the first scene, I got a lump in my throat with the wonderful scene of the son of Oberlin, the yeah. character, trying to save just this really, a really powerful, moving scene yeah. of the waters coming and stats saying, you cannot save me. Right. And again, no. and, there's, and there's also, a, I won't spoil it, but again, there's a terrific emotional payoff as well at the end of the film. Yeah, uh, right. Yeah. yeah, that's, well, that's... That was, that was the new territory because I think in Pirates Three and at World's End there was a, like an amazing emotional thing, but it was about romantic love. It was Will and Elizabeth, and they get married, and there's, you know, sort of the mother of all love themes. I happen to think um, I can say that because I didn't write it. I think it's an a astounding piece of music that um, that Hans wrote for that. Um, but. Then when we started talking about this, we went, okay, this is new emotional territory. It's not that it's more or less emotional. It's that it's about familial love. It's about loss, saving your father, sa you know, all of these things that come into play. And I think it's a kind of a more modern and interesting uh, type of love that we're starting to see in our movies. Like, I mean, even Frozen, it's about sisters. It's not, you know what I mean? It's not about prince and princess so much. It, it sort of pivots from that. And I think that's what we're doing here too. So, so that emotional territory was, was new ground. That was exciting for me to do. And then Salazar, I think, is sort of darker than any of our bad guys. So, so we were sort of pushing the edges out, those you know, darker and more emotional. Yeah, I mean, that's another thing I loved about it. This almost seems like a Lovecraft film crossed with the Pirates okay. movie. I mean, I mean, and what a great, catchy theme. For, I just Thank can't you. get enough of that theme. T Thank tell me about the, the ghosts and his particular affliction and scoring for that character. You, you mean with Salazar? Salazar. Yeah, so, so, okay, so initially we were going, well, how much should we you know, play into the fact that he's Spanish? And we did like quite a bit of exploring that. But it turned out instead of... Um, you know, the Spanish guitar, which, you know, well, we gave it a go. But it, it, instead, what ended up needing to be there was, uh, it's, it's not so much about his heritage, it's about his threat to Jack. That's what I wanted the story to be. In fact, even in, in outside of America, in some countries, the movie's called Jack versus Salazar, or something like that. <laughs> and, and there's other ones where it's called Salazar's Revenge, or something, which is funny, because I don't know that he gets revenge, but, the, but he's trying to. Uh, <laughs> but the idea for me, though, was, okay, so we have Jack, and he's that cello that we just heard it, this, this sort of puny solo cello that's like drunk and a little sort of jaunty and uh, sometimes even silly. So how can I make Salazar, you know, the threatening version of that, right? Because in addition to looking at Spanish guitars, I started trying to find what's an instrument that can stand up to the cello, and I fought that battle and banged my head against a wall for long enough to realize it wasn't the right idea. The idea was instead, to sur if Jack's one cello, Salazar is an army of cellos, right? So and some of them are electric, some of them are acoustic, some of them are recorded in such a way that they do not sound pretty. You know, it, they're not orchestral cello. So, He's outnumbered now, you know, and, and, he's, and it's electrified, and like everything about it is, it's Jack's sound reflected back at him with sort of malice and piss and vinegar or something, you know what I mean? It's, it's the dark um, version of that instrument. So that's where it started, and then it became like, it just has to be big and threatening and layered in such a sort of a way that's uh, like rage-filled, because that's what Salazar is. Now you brought a little something special for us. Um, well. I mean, but what a great bit. Dun, dun, dun. It's like Darth Vader. I yeah, mean, good. What, I hope what so. A, what a great bad guy. Yeah, thing. thank you. I hope so. Yeah, that was that's the idea. More. Um, yeah, more like Darth Vader is actually a good template. It's the orchestral version of it, but it's like so precise and you know you know he's coming right so anyway that was the idea to just have like a really um some element of it that's that's instantly identifiable so when he's coming down the steps those four notes in a row become like jaws too you know mm -hmm. when uh, if i need to invoke salazar when he's not there or when you know he's coming it's it's instant now i mean and another thing i really loved about the score was the whole kind of uh, 
fantastic quest element of the film, mm -hmm. especially when you reveal how they find the uh, Poseidon's trident. And just that yeah. mystical, cosmic, choral quality of the score at that point. Yeah, and well, and that all relates to Karina's music, which to me was needed to be a little bit scientific, but also aquatic and... She does, she's an astronomer and there's like a tie-in with the stars and all of that. So there's, you know, an element of getting, getting into the heavens kind of with the music. It doesn't, you know, so uh, I was using bells and, um, and the choir to kind of do that and, and play her, uh, her role, which is totally counter to the Salazar music, of course. So. How, how would you say this score stands out from the rest of the pirate scores? And but is that part of the whole? that continues the, what we began in the first film. Yeah, well, hopefully it's doing what I, what I was trying to do, which, which is you know, push into more emotional territory. Um, but I, I feel like that's, that's almost more a question for the audience than for me. Like, how are people responding to it and what they will take away from it? I, I think we're not going to know how it stands out for you know, another half of a year or something like that. But I, hopefully, I, I honored um, you know the legacy of pirates in addition to you know getting us to some hopefully some really new and, and deep emotional stuff well, more well, than you see normally in a in a in a mainstream film oh, like for sure, a blockbuster absolutely. I think so. Well, on that note, actually, I wanted to turn it over to the audience to oh, see sure. if any of you have questions for Jeff. Go for it. Thank you for being here. Of course. I want to say I really enjoyed the score. I was really Thank happy you. to see great new material, but also the themes that we love in cool, previous yeah. films. And actually, I want to ask about a scene that's already been touched on, but I just kind of had to sure. point it out because it was so great. It was the father-son moment, hearing that love theme again. Sure, in the, the opening. Kind of love, yes, in the opening was just such a great move. And I wanted to ask sort of what the process was like. You know that is a scene of, of familial love. Do you right. think would this theme work? Should we try it? I just wanted to know. Well, actually, that one, I knew we, I wanted to have Will Turner's theme in there because it was Will. The, the thing that, so that, we, I think I knew right away. But what was interesting about how it evolved is once, that was one of the earlier cues that was done. Once it was done, it became apparent that uh, Will, in that scene, he hands him the amulet, you know, he sort of hands him the music at the same time. So what, one of the really tricky things with Pirates 5 is we do have sort of 40 great themes from the old movies, right? So there's a real danger of, not 40, but you know, <laughs> of having too many themes. So you know, initially I was like, I for sure need a brand new theme for Henry, Will's son. Uh, but it turned out instead, the, the more efficient and elegant way to do it was Will actually gives him his theme. So Henry, like in his heroic moments, is actually played with the Turner theme instead of having two themes. So that's, that scene itself actually was what made it me able to kind of go, oh, I can whittle it down. I can, you know, have 11 themes instead of 12 or, you know what I mean? Like, and there really is a danger of kind of bloating and having a schizophrenic score if there isn't continuity. So that scene was the one that made it go like, boom, you're a Turner now, you know? And so, so, uh, I th that was a surprise to me, actually. But then it was sort of obvious once, once we finished the sequence. So. It got yeah. me very emotional early good. on. Good, yeah, yeah good. Me, me as well. Yeah, yeah. Questions? Uh, Sorry. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm curious about uh, the studio. In this mm -hmm. case, uh, Disney is involved. In, like, do, do, is there an executive who like comes over and tells you, gives you a list of what you can do, what you can't do, or encourages you to do um, things, or do you have complete co creative control? Uh, no, it, it was more that I had cre creative control, and, and, and especially because before we started, there was, you know, it was blessed by Hans. It was like, you can do whatever you want. So that was, if he hadn't said that, there might have been, might have been much harder to do. Um, but Disney was involved uh, in that they would come to some of the score reviews and you know, they might weigh in with some notes, but really the, the main people that, um, that worked on the score with me would, would have been Espen and Yoakum, who were the directors, and Jerry Bruckheimer, who produced it. Um, but they, none of them were, were limiting in any way. It really was like, if, you know, use this theme if you want. And uh, so a great deal of that was on my shoulders. In fact, quite a lot of what would happen is, you know, they, when they were assembling the film, they would use music from the first four movies, so into the temp score. Um, but 
not necessarily with some sort of thought about what the themes mean. It was instead like, what's the emotional content? What's the size? And, uh, and I was really nervous about that because it, as soon as you have, you know, Davy Jones tune over Jack sword fighting or something, it, to me, it bugs me, right? And so the concern for me was, what if they fall in love with it? But the good news is they didn't. So when I could sit down with them and go, I, I'm, I like the weight of that, or you know, the, the heft of the music there, but that's not the right tune. And they'd go, okay, what's the right tune? Instead of, no, just shove it in there, right? So that's good news, because they were all open to, um, uh, you know, I guess respecting the film and looking up at the film and going, like, let's make this the best Pirates 5 that we can make it. So D does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Um, can you tell us about like what your internship was like? Sure. You know, especially with the Lion King, that's an incredible. Story. I know. Yeah. Well, and, and well, the thing about it was, okay. So I was a student. I was going to Berkeley in Boston, right? So someone here has a Berkeley shirt. There he is. <laughs> and uh, I, I went to Berkeley, and uh, when I was there, we didn't have the internet yet because I'm old. <laughs> they had. They did have a book called the Recording Industry Source Book, and it would list like all the studios in LA, and, and if it said film music. I, they got a letter from me and said, we'll work for free. I'm going to be in LA this summer. And I thought, you know, maybe I'll get 30 phone calls. And I didn't get 30 phone calls. I got one, right? And, uh, but luckily, it was Hans's place. And, you know, <coughs> remember, though, you know, Hans, I knew who he was, of course. He had done Rain Man, and, you know, but he hadn't done The Lion King yet. So, and The Lion King, to me, is what turned Hans from, like, a great film composer to, like, you know, an A-list, Guy, I mean, you know, I think that was the turning point in his career. Um, so, yeah, I got that internship. Actually, I didn't even get it. They said, "Why don't you come and interview?" And I'm like, "Oh, God. yeah, I better not screw this up." And I talked my way into it. And then, what I was really, what I was doing, honestly, I was washing dishes, I was picking up food, I was bringing coffee in, and I'd go into Hans's studio and like set a coffee cup down and walk really slow. Because if you go slow enough, he might hit play, you know what I mean, and go back to work and I hear something. Or if there's a meeting going on and I'm bringing in the tea, you know, that was my education. Because what, what does Jeffrey Katzenberg say to Hans Zimmer when he plays him a piece of music? I had no idea. You know, I didn't grow up in Hollywood. I don't know, I didn't know a single professional musician or filmmaker when I was a child. I'd never been in a studio till I got that internship. So the culture of studios was totally alien to me. Uh, so just even, he, I mean, like I would read biographies and to me it sounded like the composers were throwing chairs at the orchestra and storming out of meetings, right? But, but that's not really how it goes, <laughs> you know? It's not so contentious. It's people working together on a film and you hear them talk and you go, Oh, this is really different from what I expected. You know, if somebody throws out one of Hans's cues, he doesn't put his foot down and go, "Damn it, you're wrong." He goes, "Let me think about what you just said." You know what I mean? And all of a sudden, his gears turn, and and it's totally fascinating to me. It still is, actually, the way you know filmmakers relate to one another. So that was when I started to get, and I mean like the tiniest little glimpse of it, because I'd hear, you know, 11 words. I wasn't in the three-hour meeting. <laughs> He'd throw me out eventually. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but then, uh, anyway, I, I, I was still in school, so I'd go back and forth. I'd come back in the summers for two more years before I could even take a job. And I became, uh, uh, you know, reliable or dependable there. And then I made friends with the engineering staff. And that was really important because what would happen was Alan Meyerson, who he even mixed, he mixed all the Pirates movies, but at the time um, he would let me come into the room while he's mixing and then when he'd go home, you know, I, I've only just started being able to confess this in interviews. When he'd go home, I could go into the back and I could get, a, you know, a, a multi-track of, say, oops, of, say, oh, thank you. Um, Rain Man or, or The Lion King, because it was a few years later, and I'd bring the tape into the studio, and, and I'd hit play, and I'd sit in there, and I'd solo through the tracks. And I'd go, ah, that's what the strings are doing. That's what the woodwinds are doing. That's what just that one drum is doing. You know? And I started to learn orchestration that way, how, how it's sort of split out. Um, 
of course, if anyone knew that, they would have crucified me. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> you took the multi-track for Lion King and you play, yeah, but and this is what I did. <laughs> and, uh, and sometimes I try to mix it because I thought, you know, that's a good skill to have for a composer, and it is. And, um, but more importantly, it was like, now I'm dissecting this stuff, you know, and it, and it, was, it was great. So, um, so by the time I was able to start taking jobs, and I worked for John Powell as an assistant first for three years, um, I was already sort of supplementing my actual composing education, not just loading machines and turning computers on. So, yeah. Wow. But that was, that was, you know, from internship to the first time I wrote a note for Hans would have been five years at least, and a good three or four before I wrote anything for John too. So yeah. it's a long road. It all starts with the coffee. It, it does. <laughs> and cleaning toilets, unfortunately. <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I <first>. do. <laughs> Question, anyone? Um, was it being a fan of Film Scorn? Is it one of you to bring you to bring you oh. down here or something else that, that to, oh. to bring you to bring you Oh, I see. Oh, right. Well, let's see. Yeah, okay, so I was, I was 15 when I became a musician, so quite a bit older than most people. I was, uh, it was the first day of my sophomore year of high school. So I went to college as a three-year-old musician. Um, but in, that, in those three years, I, you know, I had a band. We were terrible. But, we, but I knew that I didn't want to do that. You know, I, I, sh I liked being in a band, but I, I'm not going to go on tour. And, and the other problem with it really was um, if you're in a band and things go well, you play Sunday, bloody Sunday, twice a week for 40 years. You know what I mean? Like even, and that's if they go well, right? And I thought like, mm, I don't know, I wanna change hats. You know, I, I, don't wanna, I don't wanna get locked into this thing. So even before I went off to college, I was thinking I wanna be in film music because um, I, not fully knowing what that even meant. I knew I wanted to do film music, but I didn't know what a composer acted like or, you know what I mean? Like I didn't know any of them or what the workflow was like. I just knew that um, I could take a film music course at the college I was going to, so I was going to do that. And I liked the idea that uh, a composer works for three months or longer or shorter or whatever on a movie, then they put it away and then they go to the next one. You know, And so you're getting to change hats all the time. So, I mean, like, from Pirates to Disturbia to Odd Life of Timothy Green to the Pacific, they're totally different scores. and. I love that. So, um, anyway, that's so I knew even when I went to college, that's what I wanted to do. And then I also, because I'm from Southern California, I knew I'd be here in the summers. So I'd come out, I'd stay with my parents all the way in Westminster, and I'd drive 60 miles to work for free, bringing coffee into the, you know, into <laughs> That's how that's how the dues used to get paid. I mean, I think they still get paid that oh, way yeah. somehow. <laughs> Question. Sam? Um, on, a, on a huge film like the uh, Dead Man's Hollow and the Tales, do you, um, is there a temp score for mm -hmm. edit, and is that something you're involved in? No, uh, yes and no. Yes, there's a temp score. I'm not involved in it because um, the music editors, wh what'll happen is that there'll be a music editor and the picture editors as soon as the movie starts getting shot. So they start assembling it. Um, and in this case, they tempt it like totally with pirates, or almost totally. Uh, and so actually, part of the, the drill for me was how do I get as much of that stuff out as I can? Y you know what I mean? Like I didn't, I didn't want it to be cut and pasted in. Th there are a few exceptions though. There are a couple times when, like, when you first see Jack, I wrote a few different versions of it before I finally went, no, hang on a second. Why am I, why am I fighting that? I want to hear Jack there too. I'm a fan of these movies, so okay, here it goes. You know, and um, th there's a handful of spots in the movie where it's like that, or it goes into and out of the old themes. I shouldn't say handful. It's quite. I don't know, maybe a quarter of it or something. Yeah, is, is I mean, in I, some way, the old themes. I'd like to say mea culpa. I actually worked for uh, the company that were the music editors on. Canada, it, uh, was the, right? Yeah, I worked. With, I think it was Modern Music at the time before it became Formosa Music Group. Okay. Yeah. And I, you, you had a long time. It's like two years, it seemed, and. 
And I remember the one sequence I helped out a little bit was a sequence that was cut from the film, where it actually shows young Jack Sparrow's internship under uh, oh, yeah, Salazar, yeah. That's right, yeah. uh, where you see the mat on that he that yes. he gets from. <laughs> well, but actually, that still that's still um, that would have probably been like a prelude to the flashback sequence. Yeah, or something. It, 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 I never it saw that flashback. Yeah. Okay, but so there's still the flashback, but you don't oh, yeah. see the. I, I do know there was much longer versions of that. But the one that's in there now, it's Salazar talking about when he was young and his confrontation with Jack. And that actually was um, an important, it, it kind of relates to what you're saying, because they attempt it with all sorts of pirates stuff. But I saw it as a place to like, not just shove the tunes in, but instead do an arrangement that's sort of fresh for the scene, kind of. So that whole sequence is when Jack Sparrow becomes Jack Sparrow, as far as I'm concerned. Like, he's, he's 12 years old, and he, I don't know if you saw the movie, but he does something that makes him into Jack. So I know what the Jack Sparrow theme is, but I went and did a version of it that's much more, um, I, I'm, I, almost like a pomp and circumstance or something. Like, he graduates into being Jack. It's a very big, proud rendition of the tune. It's a new version of the Jack Sparrow theme which hopefully resonates and it's like, you know, it's his origin story. There's a couple other moments in that where we're doing this, the, um, the sort of tinier version of it when he's up in the crow's nest and that relates more directly to the earlier stuff. But the rest of that flashback, I was really trying to go like, okay, here's a new version of that tune. Here's the, the almost like, we're, we're retroactively applying this theme and making it into a classic theme from when Jack was 30 years younger or something. You know, and what's interesting about that whole wonderful sequence, it's before Jack has gotten scurvy or hit the bottle. Yes. Because he's his like, a, he's pretty intact. normal. He's like a, he's like a heroic <laughs> yeah. character. He's not in his shtick. Right, you know, that's right. Like, yeah. Yeah. Right, he's not, and he has any, um, he's still wily and sort of over courageous, but it's not, um, he doesn't, I don't think he has the mark on his face, yeah. he doesn't have, you know, and in fact, the, the people later line up and sort of give him their tribute, and some of those things they give him are things that end up in his beard, you know. <laughs> 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 so you can see that, but. More questions, anyone? Uh, you mentioned you like to, like, I guess, jump source or Yes. So being on Pirates 5 now? Yes. I actually don't, because there's always stuff in between them. So, you know, so like um, uh, the closest two that were together were two and three. They were a year apart. But even then, I think that was a I don't remember what, what would have been in between, but might have been Disturbia. It was Disturbia because two came out while I was doing Disturbia. And then I did Hitman Outlander, I think, and maybe Ghost Town all before Pirates 3. Is that possible? I, anyway, I don't very, know. Very I'm, I'm asking you like you do. Oh, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> um, but, but so I had enough, you know, I, I typically do three or four movies a year. Sometimes I had one year where I did seven. So they're, well, no, no, in additional music or now I'm not doing as many additional music. So it's probably more like three to four full scores per year. Um, so they, so they rotate around. I, I mean, like when this was done, I did a human trafficking thriller, y you know, like instant, like right after this was done. So that's a totally different sound. Um, but I don't get burned out on pirates because this stuff. I mean, I grew up on these adventure movies. I l I just adore them. So, you know, I'm I'm a fan of it too, which helps and hurts. It makes me a little bit overprotected, I think, of the music. Um, but I, you know, I think that helps in the long run. You know, so. Yeah. Any more questions? I'll go for it. And not that I know of, yeah. But I hope so. I mean, look, the box office has been good, especially internationally. So I, I, I told them you can sign me up for the next eight if, they're, if you're going to keep making them because I just love them. So, yeah, I don't know. I hope so, though. Yeah, well, so, so going through multi-tracks was where I first started getting into that. But then when I was working for John Powell, he was starting a movie called Face Off, which was his first big Hollywood movie. And he only had one room, so I would sit in the back of that room while he wrote it. Um, so that was a huge, huge education, because you know, he would sit there and struggle. And he writes the way I do. It's not easy for either of us. 
I mean, like, I know some composers who sit down and, like, they sort of sneeze on the piano and it sounds like music. <laughs> Whereas, like, I, for me, it's like, first I pull all my teeth out, <laughs> then I pull the gums out, and then the hair, you know, it takes a lot to get music out of me because I'm, uh, I torture myself. So, and John does too, and I would see him go through that, and I sort of, first off, it made me feel good because it meant there's at least one other person that, that has to do, the, do it this way. Because there's sort of an image that is true for some people, but sometimes it's like a maintained image that it's like it's so easy to do this. I don't find any of it easy. I find it exhausting and difficult, but I also find it worthwhile, so I keep doing it. Um, but anyway, uh, I feel like I went off your question a little bit. Um, but I guess that sitting in the room while John wrote an entire score beginning to end was like hugely educational and I was in that room for a couple years so he did maybe four or five movies like that um, and then th that was probably more important than what I did in school I hate to say um, but but I did do you know I mean I'm I'm educated in the sense that I went to college but I also think I the way that Berkeley teaches music is a little bit more contemporary than, than other colleges. So I got um, a sense that it was okay to break some rules. I got a sense that you don't, you're not limited stylistically to certain types of music or something. So, and plus that's how I listen too. I listen to a lot of different music. And I feel like when I was first coming up, it didn't seem like that was necessarily okay. Now it's different, I think, because I think that the, the kind of the playing the composers who are working now are showing and succeeding with scores that are very diverse, I think. You know, I, we have our own kind of battles, but when I was young, most of the movies that I watched had a very purely orchestral score, um, which, and I happen to love writing that kind of music too, but that's, I would never claim that that's what this is. You know, we have an orchestra, but my, those cello, they're rock guitars, and I just, tell them that, you know, and that's part of the attitude. So I guess, um, yeah, I mean, th those were the, th I didn't ever do like an actual orchestration job, you know, like I, I never had that as a job, like a professional orchestrator, but I did learn um, composition like that from John, and then eventually I'd start writing music and on his machine uh, at his rig, and then like he might give me a scene or something and then I'd score it and then he'd come in and throw it all out and build it back up. And, but that was the big thing because then I could go, here's my version one. This is what I played to John that got thrown out. Here's the movie that's the version that's in the movie and what's the difference? You know, and that was like really important for kind of bridging the gap between what, uh, what I initially thought was right and what actually ended up in the movie. So, I, you know, that, that all kind of combined to give me my... Education. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I guess uh, we'll wrap it up by my question. Of, again, the movie's doing pretty well. It is. Nationally. Where, where do you think the Pirates music has to go? Where would you like to see that music go if you could create your own sequel or sequel? Because, uh, again, they kind of go to a different part of the ocean or the legend sure. or the mythos with everyone. Where, where do you want to, what kind of music do you want to write for this series? Well, you know, I think, I think in some ways this movie is the more classic of, of them, at least in terms of um, the score, and probably the story as well. I mean, like, in, it, I feel like, uh, if anything, we, we may have gotten slightly more orchestral, you know? I mean, there was always the orchestra, but I think, you know, um, I'm not, I, I think probably the next important evolution for the series would be to take another big risk. Because I think in the first three movies with Gore, there was always some element of something totally unexpected. Like in three, you've got, you've got a close-up of Johnny's nose for 20 seconds across a desert, and then, you know, the, remember the thing in Davy Jones' locker where the rocks turn into crabs and the ship is sailing on sand? Yeah. And, you know, like imagery that's really out there. Um, in the second movie, I think the, the Kraken did it to some extent, and in the first one, it was it was um, risky just by being a pirate movie. Like the, you know, nobody was watching them, so I think there was a certain amount of uh, like really ballsy moves that that Gore made on those on those three um, movies, and I think we started to go back towards that with this one. 
Um, but I, th I think there's, there's still an element of there needs to be a, a little more crazy. Cool. <laughs> I look forward to it. Let's give I it up so. for uh, Jeff Sinelli. Thanks for coming.